Freaky Fridays, a podcast about horror in all its forms. I'm your host, Charlie. This week, we're going to talk through some of the basics of the genre, definitions, etc. Then, we're going to go through something I'm calling the Horror Engagement Toolbox, which is something that I've developed. But we'll talk more about that when we get there. To begin, what is horror? Yes, that's where we're starting, right at the very beginning. I'm going to read off a few definitions, ranging from very straightforward to more vague and emotional. The first comes from the website literaryterms.net, and it is, quote, A genre of fiction whose purpose is to create feelings of fear, dread, repulsion, and terror in the audience, unquote. Very basic, very straightforward, very clear. The next definition comes from Dominic Sturotny in his textbook, An Introduction to Studying Popular Culture. He defines horror as, quote, a genre that represents the need for suppression if the horror shown is interpreted as expressing uncomfortable and disturbing desires which need to be contained. A little bit more vague, yeah? The final one is not exactly a definition, it's more of a description. It comes from my favorite book about horror, Monsters in the Closet, by Harry M. Benshoff. He says that horror is a genre in which, quote, the conventions of normality are ritualistically overturned within a prescribed period of time in order to celebrate the lure of the deviant. That's my personal favorite horror definition. It's a little vague, which is why I include the more direct definition from literaryterms.net as well. The second definition from Dominic Sturotny is interesting as well, in that it talks about suppression, uh, disturbing desires, and the need for containment, which are all things that horror scholars talk a lot about. That's why I include it and bring it up. It's pretty common in scholarly discussions about horror, um, which is what we're trying to have here today. Now that we have our basic definitions, let's break it down further and discuss some elements of horror. The first is obvious. It's the emotional element. In horror, the reactions of the audience are often, but not always, meant to mirror the reactions of the characters. These reactions can include things like breathlessness, chills, crying, high alertness, nausea, screaming, recoiling. These are all intentional reactions that horror displays in its characters and also is trying to get out of you. The next important element of horror is the monster, and how the audience is meant to feel about the monster. Obviously, a lot of horror is about fear, so fear is an important component to how the audience should feel about the monster. But that's not the only part. They also invoke feelings of disgust and revulsion. So this means that the monster must be two things, threatening and impure. Threatening for fear and impure for disgust. So threatening can be physically. The monster can be much bigger, much stronger. Uh, Psychologically, they can be smarter or playing some sort of mind game. Socially, this would be anything that would have an impact on how others perceive you. So if the monster could somehow impact your social circle. Morally, morally threatening is difficult to define. Um, It often depends on the time period the movie was made and the audience as well, um, if that moral message gets across. Spiritually, so demons are threatening to Christian spirituality, and there are similar concepts in some other religions, but usually spiritual compasses in American or Western films are Christian aligned, whether the film is actually Christian or not. So then, what does impure mean? In this case, uh, and this comes from notes on Noel Carroll's philosophy of horror, it means Anything that violates the generally accepted schemes of cultural categorization. Simply, to be impure is to defy categorization in some way. This is what would elicit the disgust or the revulsion response. And according to these notes, this comes in three categories. 
which are the categorically ambiguous. For this, think of an amphibian, which can exist both in and out of water, something where you almost have to invent a new category. Or a platypus, anything where the response is, but what is it? Where does it fit? The second is things that are incomplete, not fully formed, parts missing, rotting. And the third is formless things, dirt, blobs, fog, things that you can't contain, things are outside of our understanding or our ability to hold on to. So those are just some of the basic elements of horror. Let's pivot a little bit and ask ourselves a couple of questions. If you're listening to this, you're probably a fan of horror. Why? What is it about horror that you love? Why do you keep coming back to it? And now, the opposite question. Why not horror? Why would someone avoid or dislike the genre, as many people do? Let's start with why not. A little while ago, I posed a question on my Instagram. If you don't like horror, or if someone you know doesn't like horror, why is that the case? So, everything that I am about to list comes from responses to that question. It comes from real people who actually don't watch much horror. The first is anxiety. I had people who told me that their pre-existing anxiety conditions or their knowledge of themselves as a nervous person is what prevents them from watching horror movies. And then, nightmares. A few people mentioned nightmares. Horror really sticks with people. It sticks to their subconscious in a way that they can't escape and that can be very uncomfortable. Even when you sleep, it's still there. Third is empathy. I had somebody tell me that their partner avoids horror movies because they are hyper-empathetic. And so watching people being hurt or going through difficult scenarios is really difficult for them. The fourth is triggering content. Trauma-related conditions like PTSD uh, can make watching horror difficult as it utilizes and shows a lot of common triggers as plot points or important moments. It's really common for people to be concerned about triggers in horror more so than other genres. And the last one is the idea of a generally unsettling feeling. The discomfort of the way the movie makes us feel in the moment. Not necessarily anxiety, like what's going to happen, or the discomfort of watching somebody be hurt, but just this feeling of discomfort and then unsettling. But then, why horror? What is horror's draw? What is its value? There are a few things that are psychological that people cite when talking about the genre. The first is the idea that it fulfills a dark side in humanity. This idea of safely engaging with horrible things that you would never want to engage with in real life. You would never want to be in the same room as the guys from Saw, cutting off your feet and all that. But if you can sit back from it and see it without the true danger, there's this need that gets filled. There's also things like a rush of adrenaline, kind of the same idea as going on a roller coaster. The freefall experience created by a roller coaster drop isn't something you would want to do without the assurance of safety. It's the same with horror movies. It, it can also be a release, not unlike crying. Furthermore, Eli Roth says in his documentary series History of Horror that horror, quote, gives you a way to discuss the undiscussable, context to talk about subjects that are just awful and painful for everyone, but you can put it in the context of a scary movie. Horror movies really give this special lens, this special ability to take these topics that are so uncomfortable to some people and frame them in a really interesting way. You can really heighten things and take them to an extreme level, so much more so than what other genres are able to realistically do. Those are the psychological, physiological, and scholarly understandings or answers to the question of why horror. But I like horror. 
So I'm going to talk about my personal experiences of horror and why I value it so highly. Because it can be different for everyone. I got into horror very young. I read a lot of accounts of hauntings because I grew up in haunted houses. I was very intensely haunted as a child. I also got into it through books. There was a series of abridged classic books for preteens or young readers, and I had a copy of the version of Dr. and Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, um, and I read it so many times. But my first horror movie was American Psycho, around 10 or 11. I watched it with a bunch of friends after day camp. American Psycho's ending, the whole movie really, but specifically the ending, totally changed me. That's corny, but it's true. I was in awe. If you don't know what happens about in American Psycho, the movie is about a man, Patrick Bateman, who works on Wall Street. He, throughout the course of the movie, murders a bunch of people very violently, but still maintains this normal Wall Street life. It's a satire and a commentary of culture at that time, but it's also kind of unclear what's happening. He keeps getting mistaken for other people, and it gets to a point where it's like, somebody should see you doing these horrible things, but they don't. And at the end of the film, he has a breakdown, and calls his lawyer, and gives this whole long confession, and then he doesn't get arrested. And then the next day, he goes out to a general gathering of people, and he sees his lawyer there. His lawyer thinks he's a different person at first, and he thinks the whole confession was a big joke. So Patrick goes and sits with his friends, and it ends on an internal monologue about how he has not learned anything from this. He will not change. He feels like nothing and no one, and he just doesn't care. And the film ends with him saying, This confession has meant nothing. This was mind-blowing for me at 11. Uh, it was like, wait a minute, you can do this? And it opened up this whole new world where narratives could be confusing in a well-done way. A world where the good guys don't always win. A world where things don't have to be wrapped up in a nice little bow. To me, horror is special because its sense of reality is so different from other media. In horror, sometimes you're meant to root for the bad guy. In horror, sometimes what happened matters less than why did this happen. Sometimes how did this happen matters less than how was this shown. It's a genre that really opens up reality and allows you to do all of these crazy things. In talking about all this, I want to come back to that Ben Schaaf quote I cited earlier. The conventions of normality are ritualistically overturned within a prescribed period of time in order to celebrate the lure of the deviant. And I want to pick out some key points of this quote. Conventions of normality, ritualistically overturned, celebrate the lure of the deviant. What's so special about horror to me is that it really says screw normality. And when you go see a movie in the theater or you put it on your TV and turn all the lights off, you're kind of entering this ritual space. You're entering almost another world, another reality. You're opening yourself up to... What is this movie going to tell me is real? What is reality about to become for me for this hour and a half, two hours, whatever? And it celebrates the lure of the deviant. What if we focused on the bad guy? What if we said Michael Myers is really cool? Or what if we said that Dracula was this really suave figure and yes, he's killing people by drinking their blood, but what if we wanted him? What if we took the darkness and brought it much closer to us, to our hearts? And so when I watch really good horror, I feel changed in some way. I feel like this has broken something down, or given me a new light, or has shown me something I haven't seen before. Especially when I go see a horror movie in the theaters. When I come out, I feel like I'm in a whole new world than the one that I entered the theater from. There's a concept for some religions or some spiritual circles called ritual silence, where for a period of time before a ritual and a period of time after a ritual or prayer session, you maintain silence to get yourself into a certain kind of headspace and kind of reality, and then a way for you to process what has happened during the ritual and to move yourself out of that headspace and that reality and allow you to return to the real world. It's very dramatic, but I feel like I do that with horror movies. After the previews are done, I'm in complete silence. I'm ready to start allowing this movie to give its sense of reality to me. And then after the film, I'm going to process this new reality and this new perspective and all of the imagery that this film has shown me. 
if you're listening to this and you're not a huge horror fan, or you've never had that feeling or a comparable feeling about horror, then maybe what you need is my horror engagement toolbox. The horror engagement toolbox is a set of tools I've developed based on what has helped me to analyze, understand, and love the horror genre. It is not an exhaustive list. It is not me saying, this is what you must do every single time you sit down to enjoy some horror, otherwise you'll never understand it. It is also not me saying this is the only right way to engage with horror. I have just been involved with this genre for a long time now, and as I've introduced loved ones to it, they've expressed that they felt I was showing them something entirely new and that I had a very different perspective. So I wanted to share how I was able to develop that perspective. The first thing we're going to put into our toolboxes is an open mind. This is probably the most important component of the toolbox, and it is a good one to start developing first, because I think it will probably take you the farthest. Horror really relies on a suspension of disbelief. As a horror fan, there's nothing I hate more than people judging a horror movie based on their understanding of reality and how they've applied that to the world of the film. If you're used to more realistic genres, this can be challenging. Even if you're a fantasy or a sci-fi fan, I still think this can be a challenging prospect, as horror's reality is not the same as the reality for either of those types of films. Plots are often convoluted, or the nuances of plot take a backseat to the imagery and feeling the movie is trying to convey. I know a lot of people think that horror's plots are stupid or dull or repetitive, not nuanced, whatever. This might sound like me putting that in a nice package, but it is true. An incredibly important element of horror, like we've mentioned, is emotion. And so, sometimes an incredibly nuanced plot is not the right way to get there. And I think that this is proven not just by horror movies, but also by experimental films or poetry films. Things like Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon don't have the nuanced plots that we associate with Oscar-winning mainstream films but they do have an emotional resonance, and that comes from the imagery and the editing and all of that. And that's what I mean by an open mind, just understanding that, especially if you come from the very clear world of mainstream movies, whether that's the very linear, easily traceable nature of Marvel movies, or whether that's the emotional resonance that comes from plots and Oscar-worthy acting in Oscar-type movies, just understanding that horror isn't necessarily going to do any of that, and that that is a good thing. An open mind, though, can also apply to the type of media that you engage with. When one thinks of horror, the first kind of media they think of is probably film. The second is probably prose, short stories or books. Uh, some people have probably seen some horror television, too. The genre is so much wider than that, though. There are excellent horror podcasts, horror comics, horror games, music, poetry, YouTube series, the list goes on. If you're someone that can't handle horror movies, perhaps give one of the less visual, less immersive parts of the genre a try. Next in the toolbox is a friend. Or just other people. But mostly a friend. I think horror is a wonderful communal experience. If you've ever watched a horror movie in the theater, I think you know what I'm talking about. You can feel the tension build up in the room, and the release of your tension is amplified by the rest of the room going through the same thing. However, I also think it is good to watch a movie with one person or a small group of people too, because, like with any movie or TV show, talking about it afterwards is part of the experience. It helps you to learn things that you may not have noticed, and get different perspectives on what happened. I also find that trying to actually verbalize or write out your thoughts and feelings can help you solidify them more rather than going in circles in your own head. If you have a horror expert friend, going with them is maybe the best option. Lots of horror movies reference each other, and their genre as a whole makes use of tropes very often. Someone who is familiar with these frameworks can help you develop insights about the text as horror, not just a movie. That being said, there's nothing wrong with getting together with some non-horror fanatic friends for a scary movie night. That is still valuable in its own way. Next up is context. 
my favorite movie theater is the Alamo Draft House because I'm a nerd. Something that the Alamo does that's very special, um, I believe Nighthawk theaters also do this and probably some other local theaters, um, they play a selection of clips before the movie begins. These could be old cartoons, trailers for other movies, snippets from interviews with the director, music videos, parts of other movies or documentaries, etc. These clips are chosen specifically for the movie that you're about to watch, referencing important themes of the movie, imagery, inspirations. This is a really easy way to get context. However, even if you don't have that kind of opportunity, which none of us do right now, there are still plenty of ways to get context on your own. You can watch interviews with the director of the film or the creator of whatever you're planning to engage with or have already engaged with. You can read articles about it or reviews of it. Context is also a great way to avoid potential triggers. Sites like Does the Dog Die list out all the kinds of triggering subject matter that are present in a movie without spoiling the film, so you can prepare yourself or decide to avoid something altogether. You can also look into more general context, like tropes that the horror genre uses, or analysis of the genre as a whole, or other projects the director or creator has worked on. You can do all of this before you decide to sit down to watch a particular movie, listen to a specific podcast, or read a particular book. You can also do this after you've engaged with something to help further your understanding of it. Or you can do this without the direct intention of watching or engaging with something right away, just to further your understanding in general. Context can also help you develop the open mind skill that we talked about before. The last thing that we're going to put into our toolbox is critical thinking. Horror is often criticized as being racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, etc. All of that is true. Well, it can be true. However, horror gets a disproportionately bad reputation for those things, in my opinion. These issues are present in all genres and in all aspects of society and life. It's very difficult to escape any of these, and even in spaces where one or a few of these prejudices aren't present, the other ones probably are. In terms of horror and film media in general, I think it's important to call these things out, to take note of them. Even in movies or media you otherwise enjoy, it's important to not pretend that these things aren't happening or that they aren't present. So if you're talking about it with your friends or writing reviews on Letterboxd or your blog or Twitter or whatever, mention those complaints or problems. Critical thinking also goes the opposite way. Critics and people who don't understand or appreciate horror will often criticize it unjustly. For example, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you listen to people who vilify horror, They'll say it's just a movie about disgusting, cannibalistic rednecks who brutally murder very annoying young adults and that it focuses far too heavily on sick, brutal imagery to be worthwhile. But in actuality, it's a critique of capitalism, industrialization, the meat industry, and class struggle. So, when you're watching a movie, especially one that people deem horrible, ask yourself, what is this actually saying? Why did people think this was so terrible? Were they right? Can I look deeper? Basically, listen when others speak, take in and respect their points, and then go on to formulate your own opinion. This is just good life advice in general, actually. And with that, we are done for now. I hope you found this interesting and maybe useful. Thanks for listening to Freaky Fridays. This podcast began as a lecture series, and I've worked really hard on turning it into a podcast, so it means a lot that you took the time to listen in. For more updates on the podcast, my takes on horror, and my work as a visual artist, follow me on Instagram, at Cannibal Boyfriend. That's Cannibal, C-A-N-N-I-B-A-L, Boyfriend, B-O-Y-F-R-I. E-N-D, all one word. The theme for this podcast was made for me by the incredibly talented Mark Ella Roy, whose work you can also find on Instagram at Cram Visuals. That's C-R-A-M-V-I-S-U-A-L.
L Z, all one word. You can listen to Freaky Fridays here on YouTube and hopefully soon on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you enjoyed this, subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes and leave a comment letting me know what you think. This podcast, its title, and any images associated with it are licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks again, and goodbye.